Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we praise Allah Azza wa Jal, and we send peace and blessings to all of the prophets, those who came to China, to Arabia, to India, to Russia, to Africa, to the Americas, to all of the messengers from the beginning of time, and especially the seal of the prophets and messengers, Muhammad the son of Abdullah, his family, his companions, and all those who called to his way to the Day of Judgment. And we begin in the greeting words of the righteous, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not speak from himself, but he spoke from above seven heavens. It is reported that he said in one of his traditions, Al Ulama Warathat al Anbiya, that the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets, and that they did not inherit gold and silver, but they inherited knowledge. And so whoever gains this knowledge has gained a mighty treasure. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, always focused on the importance of knowledge. And we see even in the revelation itself that it is Iqra. It is starting with recite, to read. And so Muslims were always involved in education, they always paid great attention to learning the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to being able to read and write Arabic, and able to record uh, their feelings and their history and um, the writings of their people. But at the same time, the great prophets, those who came before us, suffered. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, also showed us that the people who suffered the most were the Anbiya. And so, the fact that a person is Muslim does not mean that they would live a life of ease. Many Muslims found themselves in a state of slavery. In the case of the Americas, it is known now that up to 30% of the people who were taken to the Americas, meaning North America, Central America, the Caribbean, and South, were Muslims. It is known today that Muslims came from all of the nations of West Africa, but from the Senangambia region came the Wolof and the Mandinka, and people who had a long tradition from the Mali Empire, and from Songhai, from Nigeria, from the Basin and the coastline of Benin, came the Hausa and the Fulanis and the Yoruba and the Ashanti. And so slavery struck all different nations. In Africa itself, slaves were usually prisoners of war. But in this case, a new form of slavery was being used where people became uh, like chattel. They were being sold like animals and they were not integrated into society, but they were stripped of their language, stripped of their culture, and everything that they knew was taken away from them. Despite this hardship, it is coming to the surface now in the archives of many uh, universities, also from the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. It is com coming forward that many portions of the Quran were written and different texts. The Risala of Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qaidawani, the great Maliki scholar, was written by slaves. And the names were written and biographies were written. So many different aspects of learning coming to the Arabic language by people who were living in a state of bondage. It is reported that in the Caribbean region that one of the slaves named Abu Bakr as siddiq that he was keeping the plantation records in the Arabic language. And a very interesting uh, report is written by him. He, he wrote about himself and he said the following. My name is Abu Bakr as siddiq born in Timbuktu and brought up in Jenne. I acquired knowledge of the Qur'an in the country of Guna, in which there are many teachers of young people. My father's name is Kara Musa Sharif. My parents' religion is Islam. They are all circumcised, and their devotions are five times a day. They fast in the month of Ramadan. They give tribute according to the law. They are married to four wives, but the fifth is an abomination to them. 
they fight for their religion and they travel to Hijaz, meaning they make pilgrimage. They don't eat any meat except that which they kill themselves. They do not drink wine nor spirits as it, it is held as an abomination to them. They do not associate any partners with Allah. They do not profane the Lord's name and they do not dishonor their parents. They do not commit murder or bear false witness. They are not proud and jealous and envious and boastful. For such faults are an abomination unto their religion. They are particularly careful in the education of their children and in their behavior. But I am lost to all of these advantages. Since my bondage, I have become corrupted. And I now conclude by begging Allah the Creator to lead me into the path that which is proper for me. For He alone knows the secrets of my heart and what I am in need of. Abu Bakr Siddiq, Kingston, Jamaica, September 20th, 1834. And so we find from this emotional report that the Muslims were communicating in the Arabic language. And it is said in some of the texts that a slave in Jamaica was uh, uh, writing in Arabic and he wrote a portion of the Quran in the Arabic language. So the slaves were literally writing in Arabic. They were uh, expressing their religion in the language and they write in a very legible language that, that, that comes to us. We see here Laylatul Qadr, Suratul Qadr and, and it is clearly written and documents such as this uh, are coming to the surface that show um, how important Arabic was and the ability that the people had to communicate with each other and to maintain uh, the text and maintain their culture. It is also reported that women were involved in Islamic education and uh, a Muslim woman uh, in 1860 comes into a report it's, it's, they called her an English name, they called her Old Lizzie Gray and she died in South Carolina she was educated in Islam and she claimed to be a Methodist but she is quoted to have said she said Christ built the first church in Mecca and his grave was also there now we can see that she's mixing things up and that is part of what happens when a person is in slavery because they're not able to really speak their minds uh, and, and to come open with um, what they believe in. But you can see from that passage that she was really saying that the first house of worship was in Mecca. She recognized the Kaaba and then uh, she also recognized that the prophets you know, were buried in uh, areas other than Jerusalem and the places of the people of the book or the Christians and the Jews. And so therefore, um, we find that Muslims are scholars are living within slavery. That great ulama were captured in West Africa and were taken to the Americas. One such scholar who found himself in a state of slavery was Ayub ibn Suleiman. He was born in Gambia and he was enslaved in Maryland. He was born around uh, 1700 AD and uh, he was taken to the Americas and he was given the name Job Ben Solomon. And what was important about Ayub is um, his ability you know, to write the Arabic language and we find that he actually um, writes a number of portions of the Quran he writes his biography. He is able to express himself very freely uh, using the Arabic language. And he came from a very princely family, uh, from the Fulani. And uh, immediately when he was captured and brought to the Americas and his writings start to come out, they recognize this is not uh, a regular slave who is ball and chains in a plantation. So they immediately gave him a job uh, uh, in their house and he shocked the people um, by writing in Arabic. When they expressed certain things to them, he wrote in Arabic. 
and he immediately said to his masters, he said, La ilaha illallah, and he wrote it, and he wrote Muhammad the Rasulullah sallallahu that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and he showed them clearly, I'm a Muslim. So they set aside a special place for him to pray, and he used to keep his five prayers, and um, he was able to fast in the month of Ramadan, and he maintained a cordial relationship. He was fortunate enough to send a letter uh, through a source coming through. He sent a letter to one of the geographical societies. And because his family was well known uh, in West Africa, it came to um, the authorities and they paid for his freedom. And so Ayub ibn Sulaiman um, was eventually free. He traveled throughout America and he actually uh, succeeded in impressing people throughout the United States. He also traveled uh, to England and it is said that the Queen of England actually gave him a present and um, he um, was sh it was a shock to people to see him writing the Arabic and to see the Edda, to see the character that he had even though he was coming out of a state of slavery. He finally reached his home uh, in Gambia and he was involved in uh, struggling against slavery. What he would do is that he would gather his money together and any time he heard of anybody from his clan uh, uh, and of the Muslims who was enslaved, he would purchase that person's freedom because he had suffered in the slavery period and he didn't want this to happen to other people uh, similarly to what he had experienced. So Ayub ibn Sulaiman was a very important person and um, he leaves a, a, a trace of nobility within Islam up until today. Another important uh, personality is uh, Abdurrahman ibn Ibrahim. And uh, reports are coming about Abdurrahman that uh, he was born in Timbuktu, but he was raised in Puta Jalan in what is now present day Guinea. And he was a warrior, he was an Amir. He was born in 1762 and he was enslaved in Mississippi. And what is important about Abdurrahman is that um, he, he struggles um, throughout uh, uh, his slavery and he is dignified. And just his presence alone is so prince-like that they called him Prince and he became well known within the society itself. Let's take a break for a moment and then come back to hear more about Prince. Abdurrahman and the other scholars in slavery. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode of our series on supplication. In fact, that this part of Islam, it's a requirement, it's an obligation, it's a fariba, it's an act of worship that must only be devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one other than Allah. He is close to you, He is kharib, He is all hearing. So worship Him, make dua to Him, respond to Him and he will respond uh, to you. One of the most important personalities from the scholars of slavery was Abdurrahman, the son of Ibrahim. He was born in the year 1762 in Timbuktu. He was raised in Puta Jalan in Guinea. And after a long ordeal in the Middle Passage, he found himself in Mississippi. Despite the torture and, and, and the terrible conditions he was forced to live in, he maintained a very princely uh, stature. So he was called Prince. And um, he maintained his ability to, to read and write in Arabic and um, he was a scholar, he was an emir, and he was actually the leader of a great army. And this was recognized immediately by his slave masters. And so they made him um, the leader uh, of the, the slaves. He was actually the one who kept the slaves in line. 
And despite what was happening to him, he always wanted to be freed from slavery to return to his own. It is reported that um, Abdurrahman uh, saw a person, a white American uh, doctor, a person who had been in West Africa, who had actually uh, uh, suffered and, and gotten very sick and was indebted to Abdurrahman's family. And so when he saw this man, he called the man and he reminded him that his family had taken in the man for three months in West Africa and he asked the man to get him out of slavery. So this man then began to raise funds in order to free Abdurrahman from slavery. Eventually he was able to get out and he started to tour the country. During this time he was asked to write the Lord's Prayer. So now he's asked to write something in Arabic. They, they, they like his Arabic writing. So they say to him, and maybe this is a type of joke or, or you know, they're playing with him, and they say, uh, can you write the Lord's Prayer in Arabic? So Abdurrahman writes the Lord's Prayer. This is the actual text. And it says the Lord's Prayer, and he writes, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Al-Rahman Al-Rahim, Maliki Yawmuddin, and he writes the Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Quran. But they can't read Arabic, so they don't know um, that it's actually the, the Fatiha that he's read. And, and this is a very interesting document um, because it shows what happens in the slavery period, uh, and it shows, uh, um, you know, the, the, the fact that Muslims respected their faith, even though they were forced to appear as though they had accepted uh, Christianity. So Abdurrahman toured the country and he raised funds uh, to get his wife out of slavery, which he did. And then he was trying to raise funds for his children, but he was not able to do this. Because of a political change in the atmosphere in America, he ended up going back to his country. Uh, fate had it, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came in. And six months after he returned um, to his home in West Africa, he, uh, he got cholera and he died. His, some of his children did, however, return to West Africa. They were freed from slavery and they were eventually reunited um, with his mother uh, in West Africa. Another interesting uh, personality is Yaro Mahmud. Yaro Mahmud um, has one of the most um, well-known faces or amongst the slaves. He was born in the 1700s and he died at the age of 128. He was freed from slavery after 70 years. Just imagine 70 years in slavery. But when you look at his face, he's a man over 100 years old, uh, he still looks like he's young. And so Yaro Mahmud is a very interesting personality, uh, a well-known person highly respected and um, he is a person who is respected by African Americans uh, up until today. Another important personality within the scholars of slavery is Omar Ibn Sayyid. And Omar Ibn Sayyid um, is known because of his prolific ability to write. And he uh, is reported to have written 14 manuscripts he wrote his own autobiography in the Arabic language. Um, unfortunately, he died in a state of slavery. And the writings of uh, uh, Omar Ibn Sayyid are being studied in America up until today. What we find within these documents is a powerful use of the Arabic language. And we find um, a man expressing himself writing about his life, giving details through the Arabic. So he was highly proficient and, and he was able to express deep thoughts within the Arabic language. And his uh, documents or some of his documents are actually available in America today. Um, uh, at last uh, word, they, they were in the city of Detroit. Um, they were purchased by uh, African American uh, Muslims and they are on display um, in institutes and um, this is part of the rich heritage uh, of uh, Africans in America and especially Muslims uh, who had come to this part of the world. 
But it's crucial again for us to remember that these are people living in bondage, but they are ulama, they are scholars, and they are writing the texts, they are maintaining their dignity, they are maintaining their honor, and suffering at the same time. And this is part of the uh, message or part of the duty and responsibility of the prophets, and that was that even though they were suffering, uh, they still maintained their dignity. So the scholars in slavery in America had a great uh, heritage, and they become important people uh, for our understanding of what happened in this region. After this, we find also that there are other uh, individuals who are well known. From amongst them were two slaves who were uh, enslaved in Georgia on the Sapelo Islands, Bilali Muhammad and Saleh Bilali were two Imams known of course in Mende language as Almanis and this is how they were uh, uh, referred to and this uh, picture is from the, the documents, the actual document of Bilali Muhammad uh, himself that was written in uh, Georgia on the Sapelo Islands. And again it's interesting to see the usage of the word Almamis. We saw this appear in Central America when the people within uh, Panama and Honduras, the areas where African people were living in Central America, would actually use the term Almamis and Jaras and Guabas and Kaba. They were using West African Mande terminologies. Again, the word Almamis comes from Al Imamu, which comes from Al Imam. So both Bilali Muhammad and Saleh Bilali were Imams and leaders of their people, and their relatives are still living within these islands in Georgia today. What they are known for, especially in American history, is that they were literally given um, the, the military responsibility to protect the islands. So their relationship with their slave masters and the authorities was different than uh, other slaves that we find coming out of American history. Because they were literally given weapons, and, and we find that when this island was under attack, that they actually protected the islands and um, they were respected by their people and given all of the, the, the dignity and all of the rights of an Imam within an Islamic territory. Bilali Muhammad uh, was known as a person who was strict in his prayers. He would constantly make his salat and he carried a rug uh, along with him and even when they were working he would stop and he would make his prayers. He constantly wore a fess uh, on his head and um, he would make his dua to the creator of the heavens and the earth. And when he eventually passed away, um, they put his fez and his rug uh, down into his uh, grave area. And um, he is known in the Sapelo region up until now. What is interesting that comes out in some of the history textbooks is that coming out of Georgia, the word Bilali becomes known as Bela. And then through language and time, it becomes known as Bailey. So anybody who comes from the Sapelo Islands of Georgia, or in Georgia itself, who has the name Bailey, is actually considered to be a descendant either of Bilali Muhammad or Saleh Bilali. And this is an interesting point for us, because um, when the historians look into the history, they find that there was no slave master named Bailey. It was the practice of many of the slave masters to name uh, their slaves after their family name. But there was no Bailey within the Georgia area. So anybody who was named uh, Bailey was more than likely a descendant of Muslims. Why this is important is because one of the great abolitionists, a person well known in American history named Frederick Douglass, he was a direct descendant of the Baileys. So this great abolition abolitionist, this great freedom fighter who was known in American history was more than likely coming out of an Islamic background. It's also interesting to note that other names amongst the slaves were, were, were being uh, distorted and mispronounced and changed into English names. 
Abu Bakr was changed into Bukr. And we find other names uh, which are being changed. And so therefore, um, one, another great personality uh, in the South, whose name was Booker T. Washington, um, may possibly also have come from an Islamic background. So if you look at African American history and American history, if you say that Booker T. Washington, who was a great leader of uh, uh, a college, a great educator, Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass came from Muslim backgrounds, then we would literally be changing the nature of American history. Again, these are gems of wisdom. This is part of the untold story of world history. This is part of a legacy that needs to be known by the people of the world. Islam has always been the religion of education, the religion of progress, the religion of resistance to evil. And again, we see in America another part of this saga. Muslims were able to develop themselves. They were able to maintain Arabic writing. They were able to keep the traditions uh, in a state of slavery for a long period of time. Unfortunately, because of uh, the pain of slavery, it was eventually, for the most part, lost. But now it is coming back to the surface with hundreds and thousands of African Americans coming into Islam and roots, the, the search for roots is recognized to be, to a great extent, a search for Islam. So I leave you with these thoughts and I pray that you will continue to live in peace and that Muslims in the whole world will find peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.